Well, there was a, a dog, certain dog, who always boasted of his ability as a runner. And uh, there was a day, though, when he was chasing a rabbit, and the rabbit got away. Well, obviously, he got ridiculed by all his other fellow dogs. Uh, say, what's the deal with that? You know, thought you were the really fast. And his answer to that was, you must remember that the rabbit was running for his life, while I was only running for my dinner. <laughs> Well, the dog was saying that the rabbit had a much higher, greater motive than he did. And, uh, and that's what we're talking about today. Things that we do are important. I, I don't want to downplay that. But why we do those things are far, far more important. Edwin Lutzer, who was many years, for 36 years, I believe it was, pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago, the famous Moody Church. He said this. He said, God strikes at the core of our motivation. He's not interested in merely applying a new coat of paint, imposing a new set of rules. He wants to rebuild our minds and give us new values. And Angelus Silesis said it this way in the 1600s. God doesn't what good you did, but why you did it. He does not grade the fruit, but probes the core and tests the root. Hmm. Well said. Remember that was said when God told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse, and, and there one of the sons of Jesse would be the, the king who would succeed Saul. And, and Samuel got enamored with the, the, the makeup or the, the appearance of, of two of his sons, Jesse's sons. And what did God say? No, 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 no. God said, Samuel, man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. I've always said it's all about the heart. God is concerned about our motives, why we do what we do, and that goes to the root of, of our heart, the nature of our heart, the, the fruit of our heart. So the Apostle Paul, in these opening verses in this book of Romans, uh, before he goes deep into the doctrinal treatise, that you might say, that begins in verse 18, we'll get to next week, he really kind of pulls back the curtains of his soul and he says, I want you to take a look at my heart first. And, and, you, find, and you, almost are, are, you almost have this propensity to say, wait a minute, Paul, isn't that kind of bragging? Paul's not bragging. He's simply just opening up his heart. When he said, follow me as I follow Christ, he said, mimitai mimic me and the reason he could say that is because he knew that people were are often drawn to other people before they even hear the truth and that happens in the body of Christ I, I um when I was in seminary I, I learned a great deal from the books I read from the lectures I uh, I, I heard and the pages I wrote I, I loved seminary I didn't want to leave, quite frankly. Uh, but I learned more from the attitudes and the actions of my props. Being able to sit down and ask them questions and really kind of get into their soul and have them be transparent and open up. I, I was able to see their priorities and their motives and their, why they did what they did and what drove them. What was the impetus for their devotion to God as well as their service to God that really grew out of their devotion as it should for all of us? Well, in the first chapter of Romans, we get to see Professor Paul, the apostle, as he pulls back the curtains of his heart. And this is important because I, I, he says, before I show you my theology, I'm, I'm going to show you myself. And why is that important? Because I would say to you, based upon many years of experience now, that often believers, while they can do good things, 
they often can do good things for the wrong motive. For example, some Christians are driven out of legalist uh, or legalistic efforts as a means of earning salvation and or God's favor. Of course, we know you can't lose your salvation, so you can't earn it. Some for also are driven for fear that if they do not, in other words, if they do not serve the Lord, they will incur his disfavor and perhaps lose their salvation. Again, you can't lose your salvation. Some serve out of an appearance to gain prestige and esteem. Remember Diotrephes? It says Diotrephes, Diotrephes who what? Loves to be first among us. I had a woman tell me one time, she says, I asked her why she was so adamant that she thought her husband should be a leader in the church. She said, because I thought it, I, I believe it would, up, uh, would uh, lift his self-esteem. Some serve the Lord for appearance sake in order to be considered righteous by fellow church members and the world around them. Some serve in order to gain preeminent ecclesiastical positions and the power to lord it over those under their care. And some serve because of peer pressure to conform to certain human standards of religious and moral behavior. Obviously, these motives for service are merely external and no matter how orthodox they may be or how helpful they may be, they will not be acceptable before God, nor will they please God. Only as we serve him out of a desire to please him and to glorify him, will they be spiritual and will they be acceptable to him. And so today we're going to look at what, you know, the background, I mean, uh, the, the motives, we're going to get to the background, but we're going to look at the motives of the Apostle Paul. And we, then we're going to bridge that, that gap there. Okay, how does that speak to each of us today? So in Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, we really see the background of Paul's motives. This is really, you've got to know the, kind of the foundation before we kind of build his motives upon that. So in verse 8 of Romans chapter 1, it says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. Paul was grateful. Uh, Paul had a, uh, an abundance of, of gratefulness, we might say. He was thankful for what was happening with these believers. Uh, we, of course, the word thankfulness is a word, or thanksgiving is, some, is a word that we hear throughout the New Testament. The believers are told to give, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. It doesn't mean everything is God's will for you, but you can give thanks in everything because why? Because God can work through that situation even when you blow it. He can take it when you're, if you're a repentant, you. God can turn that around and use it for your good and for his glory. So he was thankful. Uh, in fact, he was, he, the st structure of the original Greek here sheds significant light. The idea was that their faith was continuously being proclaimed. But what is significant is that according to the structure of this verb also, others were proclaiming their faith as well. From secular history, we learn that in A.D. 49, the emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome, thinking that they were followers of someone called Christus. It's just a variant rendering of the name Christos, or Christ. And apparently, the testimony of the Jewish Christians had so incited the non-believing Jews that turmoil threaten the whole kingdom, the whole city of Rome, in fact. And because of this, the believers had a powerful testimony, not only in the city, but throughout the region. In fact, it's interesting, there's only one other place where you see the rendering, or similar rendering, as you see here. 
It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's a great group of believers. And if you read that whole chapter, it just talks about how they just, they, they receive the word of God in tri- tribulation, in, conf- in conflict, in affliction, and yet they live for God. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so that, purpose clause here, so that we have no need to say anything. We don't need to correct you. We don't need to say anything. Just we praise God for you. So Paul was first thankful for the courage and the strength of these believers as he was for those at Thessalonica. And listen, when it comes to to serving the Lord, a thankful heart has to be a major part of that. And, and And as we talk about serving the Lord, we're not just talking about those who are, quote, in ministry. All of us, the Bible makes it very clear that each one of us is a minister. We're called to serve the Lord. And so uh, this speaks to all of us. Now, let's continue on here in verses 9 and 10. It says, For God whom I serve in my spirit, take note of that phrase, in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers making request, if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. Now what do we see here? We see that Paul, because of what was going on in his heart, put it this way, because of what he felt about these believers, He was grateful for them, but also he prayed for them constantly. Uh, Constantly he prayed for them. So Paul was thankful. Paul was constantly praying for fellow believers. Now, that's kind of the foundation. That's kind of the beginning. That's kind of the introduction here, really, to his motives. But the question is, what motives should I adopt, should, can I adopt, from the Apostle Paul? Again, God's left us all here. So what are the motives that we need to glean from that great apostle? Let's go to verse 11. It says, For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you. Let's just stop right there. Here is where Paul presents the key phrase of, of verses 8 through 15. Uh, In fact, go back to verse 9, because it kind of goes with verse 11. For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel in my witness. The the word serve is latruo in the Greek text. It's used in the New Testament to speak of religious service. And it's therefore sometimes translated worship. Except for two references in which it's used in the context of pagan worship. It is always used in the context of worship and oftentimes connected to service. So you get the idea here. Paul is talking about, he says, I I serve the Lord in my spirit, my heart, my passion. As I worship God, these go together. But again, what motivated Paul here? Well, within his human spirit, there was this deep love and concern for those Christians at Rome. In fact, perhaps because most of them did not know him personally, he says, even God is my witness as to how much I loved you, how much I cared for you, how much I so desired to come to you. Paul knew that God knew his real motive in fact, although he rejoiced and gave thanks for their great faithfulness, he knew that apart from God's continuing provision in their lives, even strong faith will falter. And it was over this deep love and concern for these believers that they would not falter, that they would not fail, that they would not stumble, 
that he says, I long to come to you. Now, it's an interesting word that he uses there. The word long there, just as a, was a potheo, but they, Paul added a prefix to it. It was one of the great things about the Greek language. They, they were very animated in their speech, and oftentimes they would add a prefix to a word to intensify it. So this word literally means my longing on top of longing. I wanted to come see you. Oh, how much I wanted to see you and come to you. I'm thankful for what God's doing in your life, but I, 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 I want to see you continuing. So here's the first thing. I need to have a heart of compassion. I need to have a heart of compassion. Uh, Look at, hold your place and turn to Romans 15 real quickly. Look at verse 30. Last chapter, chapter of, next to last I should say, of the book of Romans. And verse 30 says, Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by what? The love of the Spirit. He's talking about the love of the Spirit. That's the love that God's planning in him by God's Spirit. To strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. You can go back to Romans chapter 1. A person in, in service to the Lord has to have a love and deep compassion for those to whom they they minister. And again, we're all called to minister to those around us. And their motives can't be, how can can these people benefit me? It has to be, how can I help these people grow in Christian maturity? When I recommitted my life to Christ that, that summer, my senior year in high school, and I saw the truths of God and how they change your life and, and, and how I, I just took off growing. And I wanted that for everyone else. And I would dare say that many of us as believers, whether you trusted Christ and it was at that point it was a ball of fire, or if you trusted Christ like I did at nine years of age, but then I kind of got away from that because I, didn't, I wasn't taught. But then as I began to be taught, and I saw what it was doing in my life, I had a burning passion to see others grow. Too often it can happen as we serve even in the church that our motives for serving are less than noble when we get the slaps on the backs, the pats on the back, the the accolades, the, the, the warm fuzzies. Richard Dortch was a missionary and pastor and district superintendent of the Assemblies of God denomination a good number of years ago. You would remember him <clears throat> excuse me, as the right-hand man of Jim and Tammy Tay Baker. Tammy Faye Baker, I should say. And because of his involvement with the scandal with PTL and he wrote a book in, entitled Integrity and Fatal Conceit. And then Leadership Magazine asked him, interviewed him about that book, and he began to talk. And essentially he said this. He said, we became intoxicated. We became intoxicated with the praise of men and money and everything that was coming to us. And he said, we lost our way. And he spent time in prison because of that. Hmm. One must have a thankful spirit, no doubt, but we must have a compassionate heart, not one that is centered on self. Now, some might ask, and I would ask at least, well, how do, how do we come about that compassion? Or how do we keep that compassion going when it begins to wane? Well, a compassion for people has to come, to get this, has to come out of a passion, a passionate heart for the things of God, for God's program in the world, for God's heart for, for the world. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul again said, Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart, now watch this, to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our, watch this, circle this word, lives. Because you have become very dear to us. The word lives is the word sukhas in the Greek text. It's a word for which we get our, uh, the word soul. So what was Paul saying? He was saying because I, we so loved you, we didn't come and just teach. We didn't come and just teach and then close our books and go home. No, we gave you our lives, our soul. We, as we say in, uh, oftentimes, in, at least to say in, in track, you leave it all on the track. You don't, the coaches used to say, don't you walk off that track and you have something left. Paul was saying, I left it all there at Thessalonica. No regrets. I gave it all. Because Paul knew at the end of his life that, like all of us, one day we'll stand before Jesus. And Jesus might say, did you leave it all on the track? Did you? When that bear, we used to call it when you, you, you run that lap, and when you get that last lap and you got just a few a hundred yards to finish, there was something that was known as the bear. You know, this fictitious bear. And you can almost see it as guys are running. You can see they're running at a certain speed, and all of a sudden something, <laughs> they kind of stop. They, they don't stop, but they slow up. They don't do that on purpose. It's just they reach that point where they have nothing left to give. Now you, got, you can do one of two things. You can coast in, or you can fight through it. And our coaches would teach us how to fight through it. You got to keep on going when you can't keep on going. That's what ministry and serving in the church and the, and the body of Christ, you keep on going when you feel like you can't at times. But it grows out of a passion. How many of you have been to a little league baseball game? I used to coach little leaguers in, in, in high school. If you've been to a, it's different than soccer. I've coached soccer as well, but the, the fans, the, the fans of the parents at soccer games are different. Now that some of them get out of hand, but at little league baseball games, I mean, it is it is comical almost. I heard somebody talking the other day about a mother brought a megaphone to the Little League baseball game. And, of course, what you have out there in the Little League baseball game is you have these parents, father and mother, who know everything that should be going on, right? They know how to coach better than anyone else. They, some of, many of them never played a baseball game, uh, organized baseball in their lives. And... Uh, some of them never even watched the Major League Baseball game on television. But, man, they're passionate about that. Why are they passionate about that? Because little Johnny's passionate about that, right? And if little Johnny's passionate about it, Mama's going to be passionate about, uh, passionate about it, and Daddy's going to be passionate about it, right? Isn't our Lord passionate about the hearts of people. Isn't that what our Lord is all about? It's, a, it's about the hearts of people and people today in our country. If you're not awake, you're missing that the fact that we are in a major battle for the hearts and lives and souls of people. And it's going to get worse. Are you ready to fight through that bear? You ready to keep on going? When everybody around you says, what's wrong with you, man? Lady? Hmm. Heart of compassion that grows out of a passionate heart. Verse 12, again, that is that I may encourage, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, you've got to go back and get the first part of verse 11 to kind of tie this together. 
Verse 11, he says, For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established and that we, uh, that is that I may be encouraged together with you among you. Now, Paul said, I long to be with you so that I might impart some spiritual gift. Now, before all the bells and whistles go off and you say, wait a minute, I thought the Holy Spirit is the one that gives out spiritual gifts. What, what do you mean? Does Paul, did Paul have a supernatural ability to give out spiritual gifts? No, he did not. Paul was talking about his own spiritual gifts to impart to them. Could be teaching, obviously. Uh, he was an apostle as well. He had great authority. Could be exhortation. Could be evangelism, no doubt. But he said, I desire, I long to come and to minister to you through the gifts that God has given me. By the way, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, God has given you spiritual gifts, or at least one. Um, this applies to us. Paul's not sure what spiritual gift he, he needs or gifts he, he, he would need to impart to them, but he simply wishes to enhance their spirituality. Paul, again, had that passion to see people grow in Christ. Why do we have a passion to see people grow in Christ? Why do I, should I have a passion about myself to grow in Christ? And I know there are times that I don't please the Lord because I'm not passionate enough about Him. But He wants to, uh, as we grow in Christ, God's goal for each of us is that we might become conformed to the image of His Son. We're human. We struggle with our humanity, and, and sometimes we don't want to keep on. We don't want to fight through that bear. And God says, but I want you to glorify me, and as long as you're left here on this earth, it's to glorify me. I think um, Paul's spirit was all, for all practical purposes, was duplicated in the life of General Booth. General Booth was the one who founded the Salvation Army. And the story is told that Booth once stood before Queen Victoria. And she asked him what she might do for him. And the rugged man said, Your Majesty, some people's passion is money. And some people's passion is fame. But my passion has been the hearts of men. Paul's motive was to be an encouragement to these people. Listen, there, there are plenty in the body of Christ that will complain, that will criticize, uh, gripe, whine, whatever you want to say. But there are few that are encouragers. There are few Barnabases in the house of God's church. And I'm speaking in a universal way. But the pro person who has the proper motive for serving and ministering to others will have a desire to encourage people. So here's the second thing. I need to have a heart for mutual encouragement. I need to have a heart for mutual encouragement. Uh, there's a book that was written once by a lady, and I, I've even forgotten the, the, the book, but, but she had this description, this, use this analogy, if you will. She said, in every person's life, there are balcony people and there are basement people. Balcony people are those who are saying, come on up. Come on up here in the balcony. They're encouraging you to live on a higher plane, to get on the minutia and live on a higher plane. But then they said, there are those basement people, she said, there are those basement people who are always pulling you down, always griping, whining, complaining. You, you've been around those, and you, you, when you're around those, you leave, you don't feel so well. The, the late, great Howard Hendricks used to say, you show me a person who's positive, encouraging, he said, I'll travel miles to be around that person. He said, you show me one who's negative, critical. He said, I avoid them like the plague. I can't afford the luxury. <laughs> can't afford the luxury. Hmm. 
Ephesians 4, verse 15 and 16 says, But speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. There you go. That's talking about edification. Edification is building people up. And that's what we're all called to do. Not just the guy that stands here or teaches the Bible class. The lady who teaches as well. We're all called to some way, whatever our gifts may be. And our experience, by the way. Uh, let me just say this. Our, experience, our ministry in people's lives is not limited to our gift or gifts. Uh, for, there was a season uh, probably 20 years ago where, where everybody was all about learning your spiritual gift. Got to find out your spiritual gift. You can't serve. Listen, you need to learn your spiritual gift or gifts. But what can't be duplicated and what is to be used is what God has done in your life, in your experience, how he has taught you, at times broken you. Been there? I had a mentor who said, Byron, out of your greatest pain and struggles will come your greatest ministry to others. I read once that all of the, some of the great famous Christians, D.L. Moody, A.W. Tozer, and I could go on name Spurgeon, they said before God used them mightily, they all had to go through a crisis. George Adams said, encouragement is oxygen to the soul. Someone else said, more people fail because of lack of encouragement than anything else. I'm not sure I agree totally with that, but it's a great point. I was, <laughs> I was a fifth grader. Up to that point, first, uh, first second, third grade, I was a behavior problem. But in the fifth grade, we had a teacher named Mrs. Gardner. And my reputation had preceded me, by the way. And she said, I've had all of your brothers, and I asked for you. <laughs> Prior to that time, I had to spend... This was back when you could spank students. And our place of wrath was in the coat room in the back. And in the third and fourth grade, I spent a good deal of time during my school day back in the, the, that coat room. Mrs. Gardner said to me, I've had your brothers, I want you. And then she began to call me in after classes or after class, the day. And she began to talk to me. And she said, you know, I need to have somebody that I can count on <laughs> to tell me how kids behave on the playground. Now, if you're in the fifth grade, you would understand how important this is because the fifth graders were chosen at the end of the year, they would be chosen to be a certain number of them, select ones, elect, I guess, uh, would be chosen to become patrol boys and girls. My brothers had been patrol boy, had been patrol boys. In fact, my one of them had been captain, and so I liked those big belts they wore. They were yellow belts across the deal. I thought those were cool. They got to tell people what to do, and so she said, "I need somebody to tell me." about that, about the kids. Now, she was using reverse psychology on me, no doubt. But she was encouraging me. She was saying, I believe in you. We all need somebody to believe in us. 
Maybe you need to be somebody to believe in someone else. Now look back at verse 12. Paul also knows the benefit of mutual encouragement here. He says, I want to be encouraged as well. Listen, he, he knew the benefit that, of the fact that a younger believer can strengthen an older believer, and an older believer can strengthen a, a younger believer. We need each other. It, it's for those of us who are older in the Lord, who've been around for a while, it is always wonderful to see someone who's trusted Christ, a new believer, and have them around. It's refreshing. The questions they ask, you just love. But at the same time, new, a new believer needs to have an older believer around. That can encourage them as well. Now, in verses, we've got to keep moving here. In verses 14 and 15, it says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Paul continues to talk about his attitude and, and motive or motives for ministry explaining that he didn't, did not preach and teach the gospel because of personal reasons, but because, or nor did he did it, do it because he saw it as something that's attractive. He did it out of a debt, a sense of debt. In fact, Paul's words here that he's using are almost frightening. The word obligated is a word, a debtor. Paul said, I, I, I preach out of a sense of debt. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, he says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if, I'm against, if, but if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. Clearly, the Apostle Paul is saying, God has done so much in my life, and therefore I am a debtor to God. So here's number three. I need to have a heart with a sense of debt. We always use the, we talk a lot of today about uh, the attitude that some people have of a sense of, uh, what's the word? That we need, that we, people owe us something. Entitlement, there it is. We have this, <laughs> thank you. We have this sense of entitlement or at least we chide people who have that in the world, but do we have that with God as believers? Uh, the situation it would be similar to a trustee banker or a, a stockholder who, to whom securities have been given to someone, uh, has, securities have been given to them, I should say, by a grandparent to hold for that grandparent's minor grandchildren. What are you going to do if something's been entrusted to you? You're going to you're going to be you're going to be careful with it, right? Well, that's what this is. What Paul is saying: I am indebted. I am debt indebted to Christ. Why? Because of what He's done for me. Uh, Hudson Taylor was a great a great uh, missionary. If you haven't read his biography, I encourage you to read it. It's wonderful, just wonderful. But one time he was, it was said of him that he, 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 he was a missionary to China. One time it was said of him that he, he, he loves the Chinese people. That's why he's there. To which he responded, no, not because I loved the Chinese, but because I love God. Now, here he says, in this passage, he also talks about, verse 14, about to whom he is obligated. He says, to the Greeks and the barbarians. Now, the Greeks were known as the sophisticated, the, the polished, the educated. And remember, again, Rome was very much Hellenized. What does that mean? It means they were very much in the culture of the Greeks while the Romans t took over Greek. Greek uh, Greece and other countries, uh, they did not take over uh, the culture of the Greeks. The Greeks' culture more or less took over them. And so the, 
when Paul speaks of those who are, you know, the Greeks, he's talking about the sophisticated. I talked a few weeks ago about Plato and Aristotle and how they set up this training of this Greek culture and how it became pop, very popular throughout the country. Well, that's the idea. They were, Paul said, I, look, I've got to preach both to, to the, the educated. In fact, the, the barbarian really is a reference to anyone who's not well cultured or educated or polished. In fact, the word barbarian comes from the, what they would, the Greeks would often say in reference to those who were not educated, they would refer to their language, their dialect, as bar, 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 bar. Barbarian. So here's the point. We're, we're obligated to take the message to the educated as well as the uneducated, to the poor to the, as well as the affluent, to the disenfranchised, those who are really struggling with life. Remember Jonah? What happened with Jonah? Jonah. Jonah refused to go where? Say it. Nineveh, right? Why? Because he didn't like those people. Right? Yeah, so, and so, who did I, did I say Jonah? Okay. Some of you have faces like, what's he saying? Anyway, we need to have a heart with a sense of debt, right? Now, in verses 16 and 17, we kind of come to the crescendo. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as if written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. This is a massive theme in this particular section. This is really the theme of the whole book, if you were to grab a theme. He says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not disappointed in the gospel. Rome was a city that, it, that was very sophisticated, very polished, very intimidating. But it was void of compassion. It was void of, in fact, they didn't have any orphanages. They didn't, have, they didn't supply food for the poor. And so Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I preach it wherever I go. And so here's the fourth. I need a heart with a confidence in the gospel, a confidence in the power of the gospel, if you want to put it that way. The word power means is a Greek word for which we get the word dynamite. The gospel is, a, is dynamite. It brings about a divine combustion. When the Word of God put, is put together with the Holy Spirit in a person's life, there are dramatic changes that take place. Look at this chart. I understand that if you, for combustion, you have to have fuel, you have to have heat, and you have to have oxygen, right? Well, when you have the Word of God, which is the heat, and the Holy Spirit, the oxy, oxygen, and the humans inside the human spirit, what happens? There's divine combustion. That takes place. There's transformation that takes place. Just this week, someone prayed to receive Christ here at Mountain View. Divine combustion. The Spirit of God does a miraculous thing in a person's heart. Do you believe that? You believe that you sh if you share the gospel, that God's divine combustion will take over? We've got to wrap because we've got communion. And that's not that we got to, but we want to, right? But real quickly, what's God doing in your life in terms of ministry? Are you saying, well, that's for the professionals? Well, God's called you for ministry to serve. Serve here or serve in the world, and maybe both, probably both places. So do you have that sense of debt, that sense of compassion driven by a passionate heart? Do you have that desire to see others encouraged to grow and, and, and glorify God? That's what God is passionate about. And he wants us to have that passion as well. 